Thanks, Kevin. In fact, uh, I was thinking uh, there were a couple of things I was going to uh, that were shaping my thinking about what to say today. And the first is exactly that sort of shell shock of the uh, of the last the last fortnight of May that myself and my colleagues spent totally immersed in draft number 45, draft number 46. With the time difference between London and the UK, they'd come in overnight. We'd have a frantic sort of comment session on the next version and then and send them back again like a sort of production line. So that, that certainly has, is shaping my thinking as I looked at this report. Um, and also, of course, the reactions to the high-level panel report since it was published on the 31st of May, uh, the sort of wave of blogs and articles and press releases that have been accumulated. <laughs> so that was the first thing I wanted to use as context. Um, and the second one is uh, actually I'm moving on from the post-2015 team in DFID at the end of this week. Um, so the other thing I've been doing this week is actually filing um, and uh, working out of all the things that I've accumulated since 2010 when I started working on this, which ones we should keep, which ones I should pass on and hand over notes. It's a rather tedious job, but it is quite interesting. Um, and just, just to dwell on that second point, um, I mean, I would say that the literature now on post-2015 has, has grown into a fairly large EU-style mountain. You know, we used to have butter mountains and lake mountains. We now have a post-2015 mountain. Um, I think I found on my hard drive at least 50 substantive reports that have been produced since 2010 going back to a, a Lancet study actually in 2010 which was really good analyzing the MDGs um, and a, 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 a mountain of stuff produced by ODI um, particularly Melamed et al um, and and even just this week the the publication of the Sustainable S uh, Development Solutions Network SDSN Jeff Sachs's uh, report which came out um, at the end of last week uh, so so there's a lot of stuff out there um, just picking up on Gaspar's point earlier on timing, um, I should just say that at the beginning of this ERD process, DFID made a pitch with ERD to say that we thought that the subject of post-2015 should be delayed as an ERC, uh, ERD topic by a, by, by a year, and actually that you should wait a little bit before doing this theme. Um, we lost that argument, as you can tell. Um, and uh, I guess if we'd won the argument, uh, then the ERD report would be competing with an even greater mountain of literature. On the other hand, uh, perhaps this time next year, uh, the EU will be in a position where it needs to start to decide exactly how it wants to engage with the international community in terms of its positioning. So, so there are pros and cons, I think. Um, and, and maybe there'll be more um, appetite for a distinct European view. Um, but as Gaspar said, uh, the position that the EU has at the moment is very helpful in terms of being flexible and open and ready for engagement with the rest of the world rather than taking this very fixed stance early on that would be, I think, probably quite a disadvantage later. So then on my first thought about the high-level panel and talking about uh, this report in comparison, I thought I might just touch on the extent to which the 10 messages that you see really nicely laid out in the executive summary here match up with the sort of key structure of the high-level panel report, which, as I'm sure you all know, because I'm sure you've all read it cover to cover, um, there are five transformative shifts proposed. Um, and it's quite interesting to look at the link between those five transformative shifts and the 10 main messages. So I'm just going to go through those shifts and then refer them across to, to this ERD report. So the first shift on leaving no one behind I think picks up on the first and the second main messages from the ERD quite well. The idea that we need to build on the MDGs, not start from scratch, that we need to finish the job. Um, but leaving no one behind, I think, also picks up with one of those fundamental points in this report around inclusion, the idea that it's not acceptable after 2015 to have goals and targets that are only about reaching a proportion of the world's population. Um, and in a way, there's quite a radical commitment in the high-level panel report that my colleague David was talking about <laughs> here last week with this sentence that says no target should be considered achieved until it's been achieved for the most marginalised or the poorest in any one country. So that is a quite significant commitment to leaving no one behind. Um, the second shift on putting sustainable development at the core I think also picks up on ERD's second main message about the need to combine economic, social, environmental. Um, the HLP, as this reports, both says that we need to break down this 20-year division that we've had between the environment community and the development community because it really has been very unhelpful. 
Um, the third shift uses language which is exactly the same as the EID report around transformation, and this is particularly talking about economic transformation for jobs and inclusive growth. Again, this means going beyond the MDGs for thinking about the importance of productive investments um, and infrastructure in particular, and you'll see quite a big section on that in the high-level panel report. Um, the HLP has a fourth shift around the importance of peace and effective governance. Um, and although this is picked up, as Gaspar says, in the building blocks that the EU position is, is proposing, unfortunately, this is quite absent in the EID reports, maybe quite surprisingly, um, certainly in the main messages. As many of you probably know, this is what the, what the Prime Minister David Cameron has referred to as, the, as the tackling the underlying causes of poverty, making sure that you have building blocks around the absence of conflict, uh, the rule of law, accountable, effective and transparent governance. Um, and I think the fact that the high-level panel managed to agree those messages, both as one of the shifts and reflected in the goals, is quite significant given the mix of countries that were represented on the panel. Um, and that's something that we're really going to want to hold on to going forward. And then finally, the fifth transformative shift in the high-level panel report, we're back on track. There's another overlap with the ERD um, around the need to have a new global partnership. And I think some of the HLP uh, language reflects the sixth message on beyond aid in the ERD report and the seventh one about the importance of going beyond aid to think about development finance, other forms of development finance and some of the issues in, um, in the main message eight around international collective action. Um, as was mentioned earlier, this ERD report was actually launched formally in April, I think, back in Brussels. Um, and uh, I think at the launch event in Brussels, there was uh, one of the panelists was uh, Jan van der Mortel, who is uh, one of these famous architects of the current MDGs. There's this small group of people who, uh, who are all sort of uh, either credited or blamed for the original MDGs when they were first dreamt up back in the late 90s. Um, and he, uh, he gave a very good talk about, about the pitfalls of the post-2015 agenda that we need to avoid. He talked about overload, prescription, and donorship. Um, and, and I think these are really important points. Uh, they're real challenges, particularly for those of us who live in this sort of development world bubble, um, particularly based in the north, where we have this sort of natural bias to our perspective on what needs to happen based on where we sit. Um, just going through those three concerns and pitfalls, I think that the high-level panel did quite a good job at avoiding them. Um, I think we were lucky in having a, pan a, a panel of 27 people from all over the world representing middle-income countries, low-income countries, and rich world countries, uh, kept us away from that donorship mindset where we just thought in terms of the way that we and Diffid think. Um, and, and that helped the panel to come up with this, this very strong push for a universal agenda with goals and targets that, that, that need to operate in every country. I think that same diversity also helped us to avoid too much prescription. Uh, and it was really interesting to see some real debates on the panel um, between uh, the perspectives of Latin Americans, Sub-Saharan Africans, and Southeast Asians, who, uh, you know, who actually were looking at issues from very different perspectives. Um, and on the issue of overload, well, as you know, um, the panel came up with a proposed list of 12 goals, which I suppose superficially does look like a little bit of an overload, a certain significant increase on eight. Um, but I think, as, this, as, as was mentioned earlier on the panel here, um, if you're going to go beyond the quite narrow human development focus of the current MDGs, then it is quite likely that you're going to have what looks like a more ambitious agenda. Um, and, and I think, as we saw in the ERD report, this broader perspective is required. Um, one of the last things I just want to say, and this picks up with uh, what Kevin has just said, that I think one of the most useful contributions of the ERD report is these four country case studies because they bring us into the real perspective of what happens at country level and what has happened at the country <laughs> level. And it's really important as we go forward that those lessons are learned when we think about what to agree by 2015.